Well, welcome to Spirit of Truth Church for this sermon on Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. And now let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, we praise your name. We thank you that salvation is found in your name and in none other. We praise you, Lord, for making a way for us through your death on the cross, in spiritual regeneration, in sanctification, in justification, by which we could come and have eternal life in you, by which we could be made new. Lord, we praise your name and we thank you for all of these things. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your kindness and your gentleness and your mercy. In your name we pray. Amen. And now let's move to the reading of the scripture. Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. All of you, take up my yoke and learn from me, because I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for yourselves. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And I would like to argue that the main idea of this passage is as follows. In these verses, Jesus releases the Jewish people from the religion of the Pharisees. Under the new covenant, the people will find their rest in the Messiah and his word. And now let's move to the exegetical portion of the sermon. So in verse 28, we see that in light of the last verse, authority and power has now been given to Jesus. And thus the call is going out to come then to Jesus, the one who actually has the authority and the power. And this call is to those who are weary and heavy laden. It's not those, not to those who are spiritually strong and in control or think they have everything put together. The promise then is to give rest and relief. And this heavy ladenness is associated with Christ's condemnation of the Pharisees for tying heavy burdens upon the Jewish people through their rules their regulations, and their artificial standards. And we see this in Luke eleven forty six. Then he said, Woe also to you experts in the law. You load people with burdens that are hard to carry, yet you yourselves don't touch these burdens with one of your fingers. In verse 29, we see Jesus talking about this yoke. And a yoke is a device that connects two animals together to share the load for something like plowing or pulling. It's also a symbol of bondage and abuse. We see this in both Leviticus 26.13 and 2 Chronicles 10.4 and 10-11. And this yoke is now being identified with the freeing work of the Messiah in Isaiah 9.4. Let's take a look at that now. For you have shattered their oppressive yoke and the rod on their shoulders, the staff of the oppressor, just as you did on the day of Midian. And so there's this yoke of the Pharisees that is burdensome and wearisome, and the yoke of Jesus is light and easy to carry. And so in this case, we have this imagery associating the yoke with something positive as well, like submission to God. Now in verse 30, we see that submitting to Christ's yoke brings rest and not burdens or weariness. It is service, not freedom from any obligations. So there is an aspect of serving here. There is an aspect of bearing the yoke of Christ, but it's not burdensome. So there's still obligations, there's still rules, but they're not these heavy things that the Pharisees were wielding. Christ's yoke is not burdensome because his character is gentle and humble in heart. They're being delivered from legalism into grace. It's about love and not judgmentalness. Gratitude, rather than trying to earn something that is unattainable by human effort. It doesn't oppress and it doesn't require what we cannot give. It offers comfort when we struggle because Christ himself knows our limitations. And Christianity has its struggles. It has opposition from a fallen world, battles with the flesh, satanic attacks. But Jesus gives us victory in these, and our struggle is not with the yoke that he gives. Now, in terms of exposition, there's a lot to unpack here. First, the idea of Jesus calling, come to me. Now, this is actually a more universal call to a limited invitation. So what is it a call to? To, to? to shift one's allegiance. To turn from the things that came before to Christ now in his salvation. And this is offering direct access. He's saying, come to me. There's no ritual required. There's no extra methods to come to Jesus. You simply have to come. There's no yoga. There's no Enneagram. There's no ritual. There's no 
anything other than just simply come to Jesus. And it's Jesus that one has to come to, not a Jesus constructed in the human mind or a Jesus taught about in other books, but simply the one true Jesus. And it's a universal call. It's open to all who can hear, but it is specifically for a subset of people. And who are these people? Well, those who are wary and burdened. It's a direct reference to the laborious teachings again and rules of the Pharisees and the scribes. Again, the law is burdensome, and the people are wary from trying to keep up. And so I'd invite you to think about what it's like to live under the law. Remember, there are hundreds and hundreds of rules under the law. What you couldn't, couldn't eat, what you couldn't, couldn't wear, how many steps you could take, how much work you could do on certain days. There were rules upon rules upon rules. It's very difficult. We think in this society where we live with very fairly rule-free, because Christianity is fairly rule-free, it's mainly restricted to morality. And then to go back underneath all of that, all of these what you can and can't do in any given situation, it becomes very, very wearisome. And so Jesus comes and says, I will give you rest. And in this case, he's given them literally the Sabbath rest, the shalom, the peace of God, the true rest. Jesus is the true Sabbath or the true rest, rest from one's work. But what kind of work? Not standard work, but salvation work, atoning work. You can lay that down. This, these verses are specifically talking about salvation. You can lay down the need to justify oneself, the need to strive for salvation. And so he says, take up my yoke and learn from me. And this is referencing directly his teachings of Jesus and the reality of salvation under the new covenant, according to the work of the Messiah. And so we need to look at this in reflection and in the context of the Sermon on the Mount. You see, Jesus gave a lot of commands, so this is what it will be like in the kingdom. And that might seem very burdensome to people. In fact, it did. They, they had a hard time even understanding how they could follow it. But the comment was, is you need to be born again. And if you're born again, following these things is not as difficult as you might think. It seems difficult, but in reality, it's freeing because it's living according to God's will and plan. The guilt is removed. The condemnation is removed. And through by being born again, one is empowered to live through the Holy Spirit, according to the holiness of God. And Jesus is gentle and humble in heart, unlike the Pharisees who wouldn't lift a finger to help. Jesus actually cares about people. He's actually understanding their struggles and desiring to help them. And as a result, you'll find rest for yourselves in, in what? In God's salvation. For his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And in these verses, we see Jesus as the Sabbath rest. We see him as the true rest. Not a rest from physical work, but a rest from salvific work. We see him as the teacher. You had to come to him, to learn from him, is to be taught by him. He's the one who is the author of scripture. He is the word of God. And we see him as the true way. It's not through the way of the Pharisees. It's not through even the old covenant, but it's through Jesus and the new covenant that people will be saved. And in terms of application, uh, we find the following. It's very easy to either under apply or over apply these verses. So we have to recognize that Jesus is speaking to a specific people in a specific time. However, the things he's going to speak are going to be used later by the church in evangelism and discipleship. Additionally, he's going to command the disciples to teach people to obey all that he commanded in the Great Commission. So what is the context? Well, the context is Jesus is teaching the, the, the Jewish people. He's releasing the Jewish people from the Pharisaical law. But that's not exactly what he says. He uses words that are more broad. He could have simply said, oh, I'm releasing you from the Pharisaical law to follow me. Instead, no, he said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. Well, this, this can be a more broad invitation. It doesn't have to just be Pharisaical law, though that is the context of the people that were being spoken to. But this could be a larger application to anyone who is under the burden of a false method of salvation to simply come to Jesus. It's more general, even though it was applied in a specific way in that moment. Now, an over-application would be to say that he's speaking to all people in all times without any respect to the context of the words that the, at the words were actually spoken in. Again, to, to apply this to all forms of weariness and burdens would be overstretching. This is not the general sufferings that, Christian goes, that Christians go through. Oh, come to Jesus and they'll all be taken away. No, that's not what it's referring to. This would leave people open to severe disappointment. The only right and proper way, without over-applying it, would be to say this is referencing a salvific context salvation. It's not emotional struggles and turmoil. It's not situational struggles and weariness and burdens. It's not physical burdens and weariness. No, it's spiritual. It's the weight of 
one's sin and the weight of one's salvific method if it is not of Jesus. It's not about having a hard time and going to Jesus to have your hard time taken away. It's about the burden and weariness that one goes under when one is trying to accomplish salvation by any other means than Jesus' death on the cross. And so how do we apply this to the individual? Well, if you're dealing with salvation level issues, wondering whether or not you're saved or how to be saved, then these verses act as a personal call to you. All you must do is come to Jesus. Confess your sin of your rejection of him. Receive him as a Lord and Savior. Accept that he has died for your sins. Pray to be born again that you might have the faith to believe. And then simply confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and you are saved. And you are saved and you never have to worry about it again. You never have to deal with the struggle again. Even if you sin and mess up, you still, that does not remove you from Christ's hand. This is the beautiful thing. You don't have to struggle again. You can now simply learn from him, be taught by him, follow him. And if you're saved, then these verses should be a reminder of the grace you have received. And that ultimately, no matter how bad things are, you have salvation. That no matter how difficult things get, no matter how many other burdens, we don't have the burden of having to save ourselves. The worst burden of all. Because Jesus has taken that burden. And though we still have our struggles, they are light in comparison. And so in conclusion, I would like to say this. These verses offer a call to all. This call goes out to any who recognize their spiritually destitute state and are willing to humble themselves and come to Jesus for the true rest that comes from accepting his salvation, which he paid for through his death on the cross for our sins. And now I'd like to close in prayer. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your word and we thank you for these verses which explain the truth that your way is the better way. It is the easier way because any other way of trying to pay for our sins is ultimately futile and can only result in burdens and weariness. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you so much for joining us here at Spirit of Truth Church and I hope you have a wonderful day. Mm -hmm.